This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Drobo. Simple, safe, expandable storage for your data. To get $90 off a of Drobo Gen 3, Drobo 5D, or Drobo 5N, visit drobostore.com and use the offer code HOLIDAYCHUCK. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is a talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, this time we don't just have one guest. We don't just have two guests. We have three guests. We have the guys from Command Control Power, Jerry, Joe, and Sam, back to talk with us about the state of Yosemite as uh, we end up 2014 and head into 2015. And I thought it would be good to talk to them, not just because they're podcast hosts, but because they are uh, ACNs. Um, Apple Consultant Network members. Uh, so these are the guys that are on the front line helping people make sure that their Macs run, solving the problems, and not just solving the problems for, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith who, you know, can't surf the web at night, um, but for businesses, people that depend on their Macs, make money with their Macs, and therefore they can't afford the downtime and the problems. So no better people to talk to about this. Uh, we'll leave the pundits and the news people aside this time and, and talk to the people that are really making it work and solving the problems. Guys, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here. No, oh, thanks for having us. It's thanks great to be us. back. Yeah. Thank you, Chuck. So why don't we, at the start of the show, do this? I've, uh, just a quick plug for you know your consultancies and you know how you work. Uh, go around the room, and that way people will know who you are and where they can find you um, individually. And then we'll get back to our topic at hand. So as I as I'm starting to do, because otherwise I start to get confused, I'll go from uh, left to right on my screen. Uh, Jerry. Sure, you bet. So the name of my company is MacWorks, and we're in Connecticut. We take care of the whole state, like my colleagues here. And you could find us on Twitter at MacWorks LLC. Perfect, Joe. My company is <clears throat> excuse me. My company is Cymac. Uh, you can find us online at Cymac.com. We also cover all of Connecticut, uh, work with homes and businesses, and do a lot of uh, on-site and remote support. Great, Sam. Last but not least. Thank you. My company is the HCS Technology Group. We, interestingly enough, also cover Connecticut, like these two gentlemen. And uh, I'm based out of Norwalk, and we service a lot of home, small businesses, but also the enterprise as well. There must be a lot of stuff going on in Connecticut to keep you three busy. <laughs> interestingly well, enough, yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing that we're all uh, in the same business and relatively close to each other and can all thrive. It's, it's well, we're great. all close to New York City, so it's a densely populated area. So there's plenty of work to go around. Now well, that makes so that makes sense. That makes sense, right? And unfortunately, as as much as we all love to believe that Max uh, just hum along fine and have no problems, things happen. And one of the things that's happening, and right now, of course, and has been for a while, uh, is sort of the the, the double edged sword of uh, Yosemite and iOS eight. And I've been anxious to find out just how you're finding, what kind of problems your clients are having with it uh, from the standpoint of the OSs themselves, as well as third-party party apps, uh, how they interact with the OS and compatibility issues, anything like that. So I'll turn it over to you all and, and let you tell me what's going on. Sure. sure. I, think, I think one of the most interesting things that we... we, we uh, practically have a new name every week is some of our clients, their interpretation of the, the name Yosemite. And um, we've had Yosemites, which we have <laughs> collectively decided that that means that if you're an early adopter with the Yosemite product, you're an Yosemite. A true, a true believer. A true believer. And uh, we've, heard, we've heard it called Yasmite. That's a good one. Yeah. So we think that's yeah. like, like an outcropping of rocks is Yasmite. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it, it's amazing. And this comes from highly educated people who um, see Yosemite and see something else. I don't know. That's pretty funny for us. Yeah, that 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 is. And I guess in a way, it's it's kind of good because these are people that obviously are not steeped in Apple the way that we all are. They're just average users, and they look at it and try to interpret it and call you for the problems. <laughs> That's right. right. That's a riot. Very few people uh, get the pluralization right on uh, Mavericks as well. So that's that. You know, at least we can retire that at some point. They they call it Maverick. You know, they just they, they don't get like that. It's uh, you know it, it's it's got an S at the end, but uh, it's not like a group of things or you know a possessive noun. It's just Mavericks. That's just what it's called. Ah, fascinating. <laughs> In a way, I, I, 
I'm sorry, I was going to say, I think the most interesting thing about the more recent Apple product releases for us is that Apple makes it so seductively easy for clients to upgrade. And this just sort of auto-populates and they get a message that, you know, you can upgrade to the latest operating system for free and they go ahead and do it. And sometimes it has highly uh, negative results. You know, Jerry, I'm actually glad you brought that up because I was thinking about that on the car ride here and how that's always been a struggle for all of us. But recently, I think perhaps through user training, my clients have gotten better about not clicking that big old free button hmm. and just understanding that there are some possible negative ramifications of doing that. So I thought about that a lot. And over time recently, I think it's much better than it used to be, where especially with Mavericks, people were just hitting that button right away and saying, why do things not work now? So people are taking a more cautious approach. And this is this is where I think you guys have a really interesting perspective on what's going on because from where I sit and where a lot of the listeners to the show and viewers of the show sit, I, I mean, we have Joe Kissel on here all the time talking about to take control of upgrading to whatever the next version is. So we're all so aware that there are things you have to do to prepare to do an upgrade properly and safely. And you're right, that big free button, boy, they just hop up and down on it like a jackrabbit to, when, when it's up there in front of them. Because who wouldn't want to go to the latest and greatest for free? Sure. sure. Right. Yeah. It's, an, it's a natural compulsion for people to just want to upgrade. And, you know, we've all had that call and we've uh, talked about it uh, before on the show where it's a small office or a medium sized office and they've been running uh, their version of server and someone in the office who is in some sort of position of IT support um, for the people um, on site has just gone ahead and upgraded the server without really contacting us. So, and then, then you just sort of have to come on site and pick up the pieces as best you can. So. Is it is it possible, or have you found any clients that needed to go back to Maverick with with a single no no S? Well, it's difficult <laughs> to roll back, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, we we try to have um, you know in just our workflow the machines making nightly clones so that we could potentially roll back to an earlier version. But you know, sometimes this happens over the course of several days, and we're not really notified on it. So sure, yeah, I, I recently went into a client where. I sat down because there was a calendar problem. I sat down and took a look and I said, I turned to someone, I said, who upgraded this to Yosemite? <laughs> and everyone just looks at me going, that wasn't me. So we find that as well. I mean, you know, there's the single one-off clients, but there are also businesses where someone decided or someone that has the rights to do so upgraded their machine. I love it. Yeah, so, to, so to save money. Yeah, right. yeah, sometimes, yeah, right. yeah, because it's free right now. Exactly. So I, I love this. So, uh, so we don't have a self upgrading operating system yet, uh, hmm. which is a good thing because otherwise. Um, so, do, what I guess, what's the biggest problem? Is it Yosemite itself? Is it just the compatibility with older software that hasn't been upgraded or that can't be upgraded any longer? There's, there's some of that. I think. I mean, I, I think we can all. Uh, speak to different issues that have occurred as a part of an upgrade. I think some of the biggest things I've seen are Wi-Fi issues specifically and some Bluetooth where Wi-Fi might just drop out unexpectedly on someone. And that's been documented in, in the recent release of Yosemite and then 10.1 was supposed to correct that. But that hasn't been entirely uh, corrected in my experience. I don't know about you guys. To be honest, I haven't seen too many issues. Um, you know, for the most part, it's been a probably one of the smoothest upgrades uh, I can think of lately. Um, you know, luckily most clients have been through the major incompatibilities, like with you know prior versions of Office, Office 2004, and prior. And the big one was QuickBooks 2007 before the Lion update. So that's basically fixed as of you know more or less as of, of Lion and and uh, Mountain Lion and that era. So lately, clients for the most part um, don't get this, themselves into too much trouble in my experience, but it is more so the server upgrade that uh, Jerry's referring to. That's the one I'm always a little concerned about. All right. So by and large, Yosemite has been a pretty solid release. I think that a lot of our clients have looked for this interconnectivity between their iOS device and their, their Mac computer. So a lot of clients have been compelled to either upgrade to Lion and of course Mountain Lion and Mavericks. And so they've sort of been pushed 
to move forward with these operating systems to get the iCloud compatibility on their iOS device. So we're getting smoother and smoother upgrades. I think some of the real difficult ones that we've had in the past were when people were still on Snow Leopard and they needed to upgrade to Lion. And Lion was a pretty rough, that was 10.7. And Lion was a pretty rough release for, for everybody, uh, especially the server product. And it, it's gotten better and better over time. So, and again, this... This desire now for everyone to have syncing among all their devices has really pushed people to keep on upgrading on a, a more regular basis, and that's actually helped us. You remind me of some of the only issues I have seen, Jerry, which are that uh, clients who have iCloud enabled on all their devices and they, they upgrade, um, some of those continuity features are not designed to work very well uh, when people are sharing Apple IDs. And in some cases, we do that for like a husband and wife, for example. They're signed to the same iCloud account on all their devices, and they use the same email address. They use the same, you know, contacts, calendar. So everything is the same. And as soon as they upgrade to Yosemite and upgrade to iOS 8 on their devices, uh, suddenly everything starts ringing anytime anybody gets a phone call. Right. <laughs> and they call and they say, you know, like my daughter calls me and everybody's phone rings. Or um, in extreme cases, you know, sometimes um, the, the wrong devices are ringing, uh, things like that. So it gets very tricky. And um, either the customer has to turn off those features or basically separate into multiple different iCloud accounts. And, and just to kind of trail off of that, that, that's something I actually dealt with today, as a matter of fact. And it's not an obvious place where to go to change those things for some people. So while I would agree with Jerry there, absolutely, Yosemite has been one of the better upgrades. Uh, the continuity features are definitely big. I mean, we had to, I had to tell someone, okay, this is the reason why your phone calls are ringing on your Mac is because you actually have to go to FaceTime and turn off iPhone cellular calling. And that's just not an obvious location for many people. And we only know that because of our own digging and research. But uh, little things like that is where they need assistance. And there's still a lot of confusion out there with people with iCloud in general. There's a lot of people who have, who have the assumption that iCloud backs up their entire computer. There's people who buy new iPads and then they sign in with um, maybe – they buy an iPad for their son or daughter and they sign in with the mom's iCloud ID and they start deleting contacts and that has that global effect of deleting contacts everywhere. And um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pitfalls and there's, a, um, you know, and people still get very confused that you could have um, a unique ID for iTunes and a unique ID for iCloud. Sure. And that can, for some reason that confuses the heck out of people. And I, I'll jump in again because all, all of this is ringing of, of recent experiences for me. But the iCloud family sharing, I think, and we should talk about that more at some point, is one of the big pluses I would see. And what we've been doing a lot of is in the cases where Joe mentioned everyone's sharing an Apple ID and things are ringing everywhere, we've taken the opportunity, I'm sure you guys have too, into separating that out and having people understand that now we have this iCloud family sharing feature where people can have their own separate Apple ID, specifically one for kids where they're not targeted for advertising, and they can share purchases amongst each other. And it's a very, I think, excellent and, and uh, well-thought-out feature that's only growing and, and getting better. So that's one thing that, that I think has been a big, big plus for Yosemite and iOS 8. Sam, I want to go just a little farther on that. Because um, I agree with you. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of rave reviews about family sharing and the whole idea that people can now split things up. But how difficult is it for you to come out to a four-person family and perform that surgery so that everybody is and, – and that's what it, I think it almost feels like because you are splitting – you're splitting some things up, but you're also you know giving them access to, say, the apps. Um, I know we had a discussion here on one of the shows about the fact that music doesn't sync the way that some people thought it should, that there were things you had to go in and actually add to your library as opposed to just one person in the family buying it and everybody having it. But then again, I think my comment was that I wouldn't want you know the daughter's bubblegum pop mixed in with the father's heavy metal. So it, 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 there's a certain amount of sense. There's a logic to it. And I'm starting to wonder how much of this is just confusion, how much it, it, it's education of features that they work a certain way for some very good reasons. Yeah, I mean, um, I, it, as a matter of fact, when I walked in the door earlier today, I was asking Joe about something like that because – we had a client that made a purchase in his past, which he wasn't too thrilled about. And when he turned on iCloud Family Sharing, his daughter was able to see his purchases 
and see something that he wasn't exactly proud of. Let's put it that way. So that's a big question from people. Was this you, Sam? It's not me. I just checked it. (laughs) And uh, yeah, I had to do a little research, you know, and ask. And that's why we know we're we're so close with each other. We can ask each other these questions, which is great, by the way. Uh, But I had to do a little research and find that answer and to see that I had to go into iTunes and delete the app from there and it would synchronize that deletion. But I didn't know that right off the top of my head. And that happens as well. We sometimes don't have every answer, but we'll do the research necessary to get it. Uh, but going back to your question, Chuck, I mean, there are, is a little bit of intricacy there with performing that surgery. I like that terminology, by the way, where you have to almost whiteboard it out with the family and make them understand the separation of the Apple IDs and what they can and cannot share. I'm not surprised at that uh, because because it's almost like syncing. You know, I, I, I love this example because syncing, you would think, is the easiest thing in the world until you really start to dig into it and people start asking you questions about what you think is happening. And then syncing becomes a whole other thing. And I think the family sharing is, is exactly that, that you think, oh, it'll be great. You know, we can all just buy apps for each other and music for each other and video. And then all of a sudden you're right. The, the, the parents may have access to things that the kids shouldn't, or at least that they would prefer they, they not. And so that then you start to get into the, those issues of permissions and who can see what, and it becomes a lot more complex. Absolutely. It, it's highly complex. And most people think that calendar syncing or even contact syncing is, is uh, an easy thing to do. And we've had on our show John Chafee from Busy Cal, Busy Mac. And uh, they're coming out shortly with Busy Contacts. And I believe you could sign up for the beta program for that. And he said just, just doing what they do, you know, contacts and calendars, one of the most difficult things for them in the world to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's a non-trivial thing, just getting devices to sync amongst each other and to share, uh, apps and programs and music, uh, in a family environment. And the, the, the difficult thing too, is that there's so many layers to this and people have this sort of, um, preconceived notion that they should just be able to, it, to sort of grok it or understand it, you know, to just turn on their phone and somehow this is all going to, all this wisdom is just going to flow into their body. And, you know, part of that, and again, we're not blaming Apple at all, but Apple does have this moniker of their technologies just work. And they do just work, but it it takes a little bit of time and some, and there are, there's definitely a lot of depth there. Yeah. There, I mean, there are rules that you have to go by sure. to, 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 because it works a certain way. I, th- this is another topic we've been exploring on the show on and off, is that now as, as, feature, as features become more powerful, is there a way to truly have them as simple as it, it used to be when you were thinking one person, one Mac? Now, it, it's, it went beyond that to one person, one Mac, one iPhone, then one person, one Mac, one iPhone, one iPad. Now we get into the family sharing. I, I'm not convinced that there's a way to really simplify this to the point that it just it just works. I, I, it can just work if you don't mind having having some things happen. Maybe you'd prefer they not happen. That's true. Yeah, a lot of times you have to learn to kind of think like a computer, think like a programmer, to understand you know why something works a certain way. Um, and there, it's it's never going to just satisfy a hundred percent of of uh, you know people's uh, needs. I think it's only going to ever get to eighty to ninety percent. And those other cases are where we come in to coach people through it and to kind of you know show them why it works a certain way. Um, a lot of these issues come down to clients hoping that it would be able to just read their mind, like you know they want it to work a certain way. And you know why doesn't it work the way I, I'd expect? And you know, like you were saying earlier, you do have to sort of walk them through that and help them understand why the defaults are set up a certain way and why it needs to be done a little bit differently in their unique scenario. Right. And and going upon that. It- you know, adding things like family sharing is you're adding another layer of complexity, but at That's the right. same time saying it's simple. So they're trying to kind of uh, have both both sides of it, basically adding more features, but making it more simplistic. And you, you can't always have it both ways. And of course, just, our ex- yeah, so, and our expectations are so much higher because now we want this unified syncing among all our devices. And years ago, it wasn't like that. You know, where you had your computer, and that's where your contacts lived. And if you wanted them on your phone, you had to manually punch them in, unless you had some sort of uh, palm device or something like that. So you know, there's a lot more going on. 
and and I listened to some of this from an academic standpoint because I don't have kids, I'm not married, so and, and there's times I'm kind of glad I've made those choices because it makes my life a lot easier. I only <laughs> I only have iPads, I, iPhones, and Macs to deal with, not the, not the kids and the wife. So, <laughs> Joe, go, go back though for a second. I that was an interesting statement that you have to th learn to think a little bit like a programmer. Do you think it's it's a case of that? Well, it is probably now to survive, but do you think we need to have more? effort on the part of the programmers to think like the average person? Or that, absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if I could make any specific recommendations or anything like that, but I, I've just found over the last, you know, 10 plus years I've been doing this that um, I begin to think like, um, how, let's see, where would a programmer put this or where should this option be? You know, you kind of have to get good at thinking about things that way. Um, and I think you're right. I think it would be great if a programmer would, would learn to think like a user, you know, what, what would the terminology be that a user would, would think about this? And Apple does some of that, you know, you can, you can, in the spotlight, you can search for, um, you know, brightness to find like the display preference or, or something like that. You know, they do kind of make things a little bit easier to find in that way. Um, but overall, uh, I think there's a lot more that could be done to not only lay things out a little bit better, but also to, um, I guess, uh, make things work a little bit more reliably. I'd like to see more efforts made toward um, reliability uh, and I mean, to me, a lot of times these systems seem like they're so brittle, like they're just things are things are broken. Things just break very easily. Um, you know, connections that don't work. Um, you know, one uh, a password doesn't get updated in the right place, and suddenly, you know, a person doesn't realize that that things are not updating in the way they think they are, or syncing in the way they think they are, and now they lose data. Um, things like that. I, I it's. I don't know. Maybe I've just uh, started to reach a point of burnout after doing this for so long. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just wish that more time would be spent, almost like what Apple did with Snow Leopard. Remember when they announced no new features? That was the big feature. No new features, <laughs> and that was a great release. It was so stable, and it was really well put together. And I think they spent a lot of time on things that just you know were had been lacking for years. And I'd love to see them do that again with. Yeah, you know, somebody was that to some extent because I think things do work really well. But another no new features release would be fantastic. I think you hit on something important, and where we'll probably see Apple sort of sort of slow down the release cycle because they've been pushing so hard with new releases every single year and pushing so many new features in that it's almost too much for the typical end user to handle. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Joe's right in that respect. And I think we'll almost see that slow down in a way where people need to catch up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need to be able to understand these new features before uh, many new ones just come out. And we're spending a lot of our time dealing with these new features and helping our customers with that. And then all of a sudden, uh oh, here's a new release. And here's what we have to do to learn this, uh, uh, these additional 10 new features. So I understand what he's saying there. And I would agree is, is that if, if they've let it at least sit for a while with their customers, with their end users, and have them understand it, it would, be, uh, it would allow them to soak it in longer and understand it better. I, I think it's really difficult for Apple. Obviously, they have a responsibility to their shareholders to respond to th products like Samsung when they're constantly adding more features. And so there's this sort of race to the top of who can uh, you know, match feature by feature. So there's a certain element of that going on. And obviously, Apple... Um, I, I, I echo the sentiments of my colleagues here that I would love to see a little bit of a slowdown, but I think that we're going to continue to see this yearly release cycle with more features added. You know, there's so many potential like gotchas. <laughs> <Jerry. laughs> there's so many potential <laughs> gotchas um, that sort of happen along the way that that just confuse users. And I'll give you an example. This is something that I dealt with today, where a client um, had an iCloud identity that was the same uh, email address as her Exchange account with a uh, Microsoft hosted exchange account. So she was wondering why her entries in her calendar in the uh, Apple calendar app were not syncing back to her exchange account. And it was for the simple fact that in the Apple calendar app, it was getting confused by the fact that there was this identity called Jane at mycompany.com for her iCloud identity. And there was Jane at mycompany.com for her exchange account. And so the calendars were just banging into one another. And so the only way we could resolve that was to change her iCloud identity to something else, to another, to an alternate email address. And then everything worked perfectly. So there's 
so many little sort of like stumbling blocks along the way that pitfalls for people. So that's where we come in and hopefully, you know, be able to come on site and be efficient and uh, solve the problem pretty quickly for them. Today's Mac Voices is sponsored by Drobo. Simple, safe, expandable storage for your data. There's a saying among tech people that it isn't a question of if your hard drive will fail, but when it will fail. And it's absolutely 100% true. Those drives have moving parts and moving parts wear out sooner or later. And there are a few worse feelings than knowing that the drive that houses your family photos or that presentation to the board of directors is on the drive that just started grinding and making nasty noises and won't mount on your desktop. That's one of the reasons we talk so much about backups here on Mac Voices and why I keep telling you that a Drobo is one of the best ways to protect yourself from drive failure. Drobo uses their Beyond Raid technology to spread your data out over four drives in their Drobo Gen 3 or five drives in the Drobo 5N and Drobo 5D so that when one goes bad, you don't lose anything. In fact, if you want to improve your odds even more, you can set up your Drobo to protect your data if two drives fail at the same time. The odds of that are fairly slim, but it could happen. Of course, that's just part of the Drobo story. When a drive goes bad, not only do you not lose any data, but you aren't even inconvenienced. Your data is still right there, accessible like it always was. You'll know something went wrong because of the Drobo's easy to understand indicator lights. Green means all is good. Yellow means you need to pay attention to something. And blinking red tells you that a drive went bad and you need to replace it as soon as possible. One thing that's certain about your digital life and mine and everybody else's, we're going to all need more storage moving forward. We're taking more pictures, shooting more movies, doing more projects at work and at home. All stuff we want to save for one reason or another. That's why Drobo is designed to grow with you by allowing you to upgrade your storage as you wish. Put in one or two terabyte drives now, upgrade those to three or four terabyte drives when you need more storage, and after that, there are six terabyte and even eight terabyte drives, all compatible with the Drobo you buy today. That's expandability, that's value, that's Drobo. The new Gen 3 Drobo has all the latest and greatest enhancements that Drobo has to offer. Like a small SSD cache and a battery that protects your data while it's being written, just in case the power happens to go out at just the wrong moment. The two drive protection I mentioned. A new SuperSpeed USB 3 interface and dual core processor, so you're not waiting on your Drobo for anything. And let's not overlook the Drobo 5D, with a Thunderbolt interface and even an optional SSD cache that makes it super fast and suitable for video and audio production. And the Drobo 5N, also with an optional SSD cache, the Drobo that sits on your network and serves files to all your Mac and iOS devices. And PCs too, of course, if you have one of those laying around somewhere. All the Drobos are great choices depending on your needs. The Drobo Gen 3 is probably where you want to start. At the list price of $349, the Drobo Gen 3 is a third less than its predecessor and the most affordable Drobo yet. $349 is a great price for all those features. But the Drobo folks and I want you to experience the benefits of Drobo and not lose your data. So for now, until December 29th, you can get a full $90 off the Drobo Gen 3 or the Drobo 5D or the Drobo 5N by going to drobostore.com slash macvoices and using the code HOLIDAYCHUCK. Those are amazing prices for amazing devices that protect your data and grow with your needs, all while remaining simple to use and upgrade. You can also register to win a Drobo Gen 3 by visiting drobo.com slash macvoices by December 31st. The best plan is to order your new Drobo, then register to win a free one and give it to a friend. Or register then order. Either way, you go home with a new Drobo and might have an extra one to share. After midnight on December 29th, I take off this hat and that's the end of the offer. So go to drobostore.com slash macvoices and use the code HOLIDAYCHUCK to get a full $90 off your choice of the Gen 3 Drobo, Drobo 5D, or Drobo 5N. Drobo. Simple, safe, expandable storage for your data. Get yours today, and thanks to Drobo for their support of Mac Voices. It's got to be. It's got to be really interesting, I think. Um, to, but to go back to the feature thing, I did want to comment on that. 
I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm with Jerry because I think that we all get, and you all especially, I mean, you guys, again, are on the front lines when they come out with 200 new features. But the thing is, those features don't all apply to everyone. And, and I think part of the problem, I would guess, is that people want to go in there and experiment with the feature, but they really don't need it, didn't need it to start with. It's just one of those they want to play with. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think they almost have to do this because a, a graphics professional is not going to need the same set of features that an accounting professional does, that an engineering professional does. And then we can just go right on out through the disciplines. So I, I think it's good. They, I think they do have to keep up because there have been times that they've been criticized for not keeping up. Um, but at the same time, boy, it, it is a challenge for you and for the end users to sort of pick and choose which ones they want to want to play with or work with, and which ones are really important to them. That sounds like a double bet, Chuck. So <laughs> I'll take both of you guys on for that one. <laughs> All right, we'll All discuss right. the terms after the show. Pizza. <laughs> Excellent. Pizza. Yeah. Gentlemen's bet. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Let's talk a little bit about iOS 8, and, and we've we've been skirting around that a little bit as as how it relates to Yosemite, but how about iOS 8 on its own? Do you guys get many calls for uh, for problems with iOS 8? Here and there. I, I mean, it, the, the look and feel of iOS 8, I'm sure you guys will agree, is very similar to iOS 7 with the additional features, especially with family sharing. So I think from that side of things, customers have been a little bit at ease with the transition, whereas from iOS 6 to iOS 7, everything changed so dr drastically that people were almost upset about it. So uh, although we've dealt with some issues here and there, of course, and that being with syncing or backups or uh, especially um, space usage when trying to perform the update, the transition has been fairly straightforward for the end user. Yeah, maybe you could speak to that a little bit more, Sam, how people get confused with their iPhone being full and not understanding about the backups to iCloud yeah. and how that's different from filling up a 16 gig device. Right, right. Well, there's the iCloud backup, which by default is five gigabytes and gives you the ability to back up multiple devices to that same iCloud account, which can run out of space, and Apple offers a monthly cost to upgrade that. And then there's the differentiation between the actual space on the device for storing your own personal data, music, and photos. So uh, a lot of people get confused between the two, and especially in the time of performing the update, it may say, your iPhone doesn't have enough space. And uh, the, the updates and can take... A and so they go. So they go to the backup, and they buy more space for the backup. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 it confuses the heck out of them. And this is something that we probably deal with on a weekly basis with people. It makes perfect sense, and I would never have sure. thought of that, that. That that would be the reaction of people after you explain it. Why? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just I'm out of space. I'll go get more, and <laughs> they still have the same problem. Right. And we don't fault them necessarily for it. I mean, we know these answers because we do this every day, but right. it is confusing. I mean, it, and that's why we're here. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it, part of the thing is we rely on each other, but also as part of our podcast, doing it every week, we rely on, on our audience. I find I get a lot of answers <laughs> from people that I talk to in the chat room and things like that, where I'm like, I did not know that. So right. I pick up just as much as they do, hopefully, from me. So our podcast, just to f focus on that for a minute, is not necessarily for the Apple consultant. I mean, certainly a lot of the people that tune in are Apple consultants. But if you're tech-minded or you really like to sort of roll up your sleeves and sort of do a deep dive, um, you know, we share all our information openly. And, you know, sometimes we talk about products. Sometimes we talk about NAS devices, direct attached storage, and it may be focused on that on a, a given show. Um, and a lot of the topics are just free-flowing, or we may talk about, you know, I, iCloud syncing. So um, for anybody who wants to sort of just get another perspective, they can certainly pick up some valuable information, hopefully along the way. So Jerry, it, it's your fault that that subject is coming up, because <laughs> one of the things I wanted to make sure we touched on was iCloud and the, the, the newest version of iCloud the, with, with the syncing, iCloud Drive, of course, and all. Uh, when, when iOS 8 came out, there seemed to be, well, no, there was some confusion about, you know, should it be turned on, should it be turned off, and if you do the wrong thing, you'll wipe out data. Um, so how are you all finding that transition uh, now that we're sort of over that hump and maybe past some of those initial problems? 
that hasn't been too much of an issue for me personally in, in most of the clients that I see. And again, we, we kind of have the same sort of core clients. Some are educational, small to medium-sized business, and a, and a, a group of uh, residential clients as well. And the media made a big deal out of that, the iCloud backup. And um, I think if you're, if you're steeped in the iWork ecosystem, it had a, it had an impact, but a lot of the business clients that we do we see you know are using something like Google Docs or they're using the Microsoft Office suite, so it has less of an impact. Um, I don't know if you gentlemen had different experience on that. Well, on, on the backup side, uh, if if we're referring to that, I mean we've we've had a lot of confusion, but not not necessarily big problems. Just the like cloud, we talking, the yeah. cloud backup, right, right, yeah, and and. Uh, a lot of people have been confused as to where the space is being used. For instance, if they have an iPhone and an iPad, they don't understand that they both go to the same backup, but they're, they're t taking up the same amount of space. So we've had a lot of explanation to do there just to make them understand it, but not necessarily some big problems. I would agree with Jerry. We haven't hit that uh, brick wall with a lot of our customers. Yeah, it's too bad that Apple doesn't give more free space with iCloud. I think that would you know go a long way toward helping you know, more people back up uh, more easily. You know, we certainly recommend iCloud backup now, um, but with five gigs, you know, you you may get one device out of it, but in many cases, it's not enough space to back up everything on the device, uh, even one device. And so you need to upgrade. And then clients are thinking, you know, that Apple's kind of like just you know, nickeling and diming them, you know, charging them a few more dollars a month, that kind of thing. To me, it seems like a really valuable thing to pay for, you know, for uh, what, is, what is it, like dollar, four dollars a month, something like that for, for 20 or 200 gigs. And uh, I mean, that's a lot of space and you can back up all your devices and not have to worry about it. So, you know, we're, we're big fans of that. Joe mentioned on a show that he had a client who thought that every, every month that she paid in, that she, got, she acquired more space. 200 gigs more every month. <laughs> <Per> month. <laughs> yeah. It adds up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can run your, own, uh, run your own iCloud one day. Yeah. If, Sell it to others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> any, you can sub, any, sublease that. Anybody who wants to make that offer to us, I think we have some takers. No question. <laughs> that's right. That's funny. That's, yeah. that's funny. Yeah, we deal with a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of... Um, Misconceptions, and uh, some of it is our failing to realize that clients um, don't have the intuitive grasp of the stuff that we do. Like the whole idea of, you know, of course you can't just, you know, click a button and buy more space on your device. I mean, how would that work? It's a physical thing, but we understand that. But, you know, clients, they're not supposed to understand that, um, at least not like sort of this generation of clients. I think as, as people, as, as uh, time passes and technology becomes more and more ubiquitous and, and well-known and all that, people will have that intuitive sense that there's hardware and there's software and there's services and there's data centers. Um, but for now, there's a real lack of understanding on our on our parts of our clients oftentimes. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest questions we get aside from, well, not a question, but I hate passwords is probably the other <laughs> big question. Um, but the, <laughs> the more recent one is, what is the cloud? <laughs> I mean, just as broad as that, you know, what is the cloud? And it's just like we have to kind of focus them in on there's iCloud backup. There's iCloud for syncing. There's iTunes in the cloud. Um, there's lots of different clouds. There's Google Docs. There's Dropbox. And it's basically a room full of servers, you know, and, and you kind of have to walk them through what that actually means. But they oftentimes think it's just in the air, right? As, as Sam said, what, what was your, uh, your client's reaction to the cloud? Oh, well, I had a client actually look up and point at the sky when they were talking about the cloud. So there's, there's so. These, yeah, it, they think it's like in the ether, you know, it's like just around us. And to some extent, it's true. There's Wi-Fi everywhere, but that's it, not where things are being stored. And they don't realize there's actually like a physical server somewhere. So, you know, these are things we just grasp doing this for a living. And sometimes it's hard to remember that clients don't have that same level of understanding. I get it. I get just a little taste of of some of this with uh, with being the one to support things in my office and and a little bit beyond for some other folks, uh, it, and it is it is a riot. I mean, you just you can't help but but laugh in a, in a very good natured way. You're not, nobody's sure. making fun of anybody because you know if if we step out and look under the hood of my car, psh, I don't have a clue. Right. You know, so it's 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 all where you are. But yeah, the, the idiosyncratic way people look at things, the way they try desperately to understand it, put it in 
in terms that so they feel comfortable with it. It it can be really funny. The password thing though, that just happened yeah. to me the other day. I reset someone's password and handed them you know a totally randomized password, and they I thought they were going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what's this? How am I supposed to remember this? Well, yeah, password manager. Well, I, I don't need any. I don't want anything else. Just you know, can't it just be you know my name two three four? No, it can't. Just be, <laughs> not nice. anymore. You know. So, you know, one thing that uh, concerns me is uh, one of the few companies that still allows that stuff, insecure passwords, is Dropbox. I mean, we see a lot of like, you know, lowercase passwords with like, you know, eight characters. And a lot of people keep a lot of important stuff in Dropbox or they sync really important things through Dropbox. And, um, you know, it surprises me that they don't require more um, sort of more entropy in the passwords, more secure passwords. Um I think that's the number one things thing that clients could do is to secure themselves to make sure number one everything is backed up both locally and in the cloud, uh, an online backup, and also just make sure your passwords are secure. Get something like One Password, and you know make your password secure. Do a password audit and fix all those old, you know, uh, less secure passwords. I have to agree with you there about Dropbox, but also just in general, people storing very sensitive information in the cloud. Not understanding that that's you know out there beyond their control, and again, I'm not uh, uh, taking people to task for this. It's just a, a question of being informed, and that's our job to be that informed. But qu- uh, services like Dropbox and others, your your information is out there, and, and there's a possibility of of someone getting into that data. So having secure passwords, it's too easy to use the same password for everything. So when Joe says using a password manager like 1Password or something similar is incredibly critical to at least taking that extra step to secure your data. And not enough people do that, but I think we've been doing a better job of educating our clients and making them understand how just how important that is. That concerns us as as consultants, and it just briefly just to mention is there's a there's a certain amount of implicit trust even with people that are highly visible on the internet with podcasts and doing shows of of something just because it's a web technology then somehow it becomes this trusted source and there's a very popular email uh, filtering system where you basically pass all your email to this company and then they send you this filtered email and in order for you to use the service of course you have to surrender your 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 password of your email. And um, it t- to us as consultants, and we see clients every day who um, get hacked um, to one level or another, this is something that you know we wouldn't even consider. So I, I think that everybody should, as-, as Sam and Joe said, just proceed with caution and not necessarily think like, well, just because it's Dropbox, then my stuff is safe. You know, I-, I don't think any of us here store anything that carries our social security number or our tax returns. None of that resides on Dropbox, and for very good reasons. Yeah. I, though I, I may take issue with, with at least two of you. Jerry, you may be the third, so you all may gang up on me. But I, I, I like the websites that they, they let me put my password in, but they give me an indicator of how strong it is, as opposed to not allowing something. You know, I mean, now, maybe you could convince me they should not allow password. They should not allow password one. They should not allow one, two, three, four. But at some point, I, I do think that people have to take some responsibility for some of this. And it's it's got to be, you know, maybe it's a matter of education. But I'm not sure I would want someone saying you, you are not allowed to have a password that is, say, four or five characters. Um, sometimes there are people out there that just can't handle more than four or five characters. But they're more likely to get themselves into a lot more trouble by having a four or five letter password um, than uh, the amount of time they'll save, you know, uh, by having that password. Like in other words, if, if they use a four or five letter password um, for you know ease of use uh, to avoid having to set up a password manager or make up a secure password that's hard to remember, um, then the, it'll it'll work fine for a while if the site accepts it until inevitably somebody else figures it out. Some some robotic system on the internet somewhere eventually discovers that password. And if it's for an account that's secure or not secure, but um, vulnerable to hacking, like let's say somebody's email account, then their email account gets used to send junk mail to to everybody. Um, that's bad for the internet. That's bad for their friends. It's bad for them. Um, you know, the friends get emails like, I'm stuck in London and I need you to wire me money and somebody will <laughs> fall for it, you know, and now you've got somebody, you know, wiring money to uh, some Russian hacker or whatever. So um, I think we should protect users from themselves to some extent. That's another thing I think more programmers should should keep in mind. There's 
a number of solutions out there, whether it's LastPass or 1Password or even Dashlane, which we've heard really good things about from uh, different clients. So the, the, that make it a lot easier for the user. But we find a lot of times that users aren't willing to put in any time to this at all. And the analogy that I use over and over again is, well, it's real convenient to leave your keys in your car. That way, when you leave the house, you don't have to look for your keys. They're right in the ignition and you could drive your car away. But that doesn't necessarily make your car safe. And, um, you know, a lot of clients, you know, would have to at least spend a couple of sessions with us to maybe learn a system like 1Password. But the, but the payback is um, tenfold. And, and it's just getting them to the point of understanding that. Now, we have that challenge every single day with people understanding the importance of, of uh, good password hygiene. I always love Jerry's analogies. They're always so great. Yeah, thank you. But I, I would agree with you. But I also want to just jump back really quick to what Joe said in the fact that it could affect your friends as well. If something happens and you send out a, a spam type message or some, somebody falls for something that as a result of a hacking to your account, they get an email which they then fall for, it becomes a domino effect. So you're not only protecting yourself, but protecting the people around you as well. So I think that was a good point to bring up. Yeah, I, I like password hygiene too. I'm going to steal that. That's that's, 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 a, that's a good one, Jerry. Thanks. The other thing, though, and, and I think this all folds in a little bit. Now we're going to get away from the OS and just talk about user practices. But how do we get people to stop clicking on things in email that that are questionable? It's it's really really tough. I, I just had this question come up on Sunday afternoon. A client emailed me and said. Um, well, I, I got this uh, this email from Apple Guru support, and uh, so I, I clicked the link and I filled out all the information, including my social security number, um, because they said I would be locked out if I didn't do that. I hope I didn't just ro royally screw up. And you know, I wrote back. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that you know was a fake email. And if you gave out, especially your social security number, but any other personal info, we really need to like take some steps here really soon. Um, and it's amazing how easily people get tricked into this stuff, but you, you can't fault them because a lot of it is really getting much better. You know, the emails look better, the logos are all there, the grammar's okay. It's it's getting really, you know, it's getting really tricky. Yeah, yeah. And and I, again, something that I've said, so folks, if, you, if you're a viewer of this show and you've, you've heard this, I'm sorry, but the, you go out to eat at a chain restaurant and they say, oh, would you like your, your uh, receipt emailed to you? And you've just given away your email address. And where do you think that's going to go? It's just going to be spam, 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 spam. You know, please don't do that. Take the little piece of paper. You know, I don't care right. if you, you rip it into shreds and then throw it in the trash, but, you know, don't don't give your email address out for this thing. You've just sold your email address for, you know, a, 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 a bit of ice cream. You know, come on. <laughs> sure. It makes no sense whatsoever. And I've seen people that are really careful about that kind of thing happily hand their, their email address over. And it just fascinates me. Yeah, I can equate that to also some questionable websites where you have to check a box that says, I agree to your privacy policy, but you never read it. And you never know what that's doing. I can They can say they can sell your email to third parties or what have you. And then before you know it, you're starting to get a lot more spam than you're used to. We had a re recent discussion on our show where when clients need to download Adobe Flash and how misleading the websites they can land on um, that put not necessarily malware, but adware on their machines. Um, so there's a great website that we could recommend uh, that you go to with, and they have a uh, adware remover um, called uh, the Safe Mac. And from the Safe Mac, they have um, maybe you guys Ad could help me out. Adware Medic. Adware Medic. Adware Medic. Yeah. Yeah, AdwareMedic.com. It's a yeah, it's a great site. We highly recommend it and use it. Okay, so it's 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 SafeMac or AdwareMedic.com. Yeah, the SafeMac.com, I think, okay. and uh, AdwareMedic.com. The, okay. the site owner of the Safe Mac, who who writes a lot of um, blog posts on the most recent versions of malware or adware that are out there for the Mac, he he this is his product, Adware Medic, and it's donationware, but you could you know you could download it multiple times and not have to pay for it. And and, and Jerry brings up an amazing point, which is highly important these days, which is the fact that. The question of can, Mac, can Macs get viruses or malware or adware is not the same question it used to be. So we have to be extra cautious these days. It's not just, hey, I'm a, I have a Mac so I don't have to worry. You have to be concerned. There are a lot more uh, adware out there that can infect the Mac. 
And Adware Medic actually does a great job, but there are services like Genio and others that can infect your machine that uh, people don't expect as a part of a, what looks like to be a legitimate download. So I, I would say to my clients a lot these days, you have to take extra precautions. It's not like you have the free reign of the internet just because you have a Mac. And I think that that conversation is becoming more and more important as we move on. And that may be a good place to, to close this out with some uh, discussion of do we need and is there a good virus software utility out there that we should be installing from, from where you all sit? Um, you, there's not a lot you can do about some of the things in the browsers, uh, but just uh, the overall Mac operating system, is it still reasonably secure that most of us don't need to worry about it? And if it's not, can you recommend anything that we should be looking at? Yeah, the way I usually answer the question is, now that you've asked, I highly recommend installing antivirus software <laughs> because I don't want to. I don't want to be the guy that says, "Nah, it's not a big deal." Um, I run it. I run a Sophos antivirus for Mac. The Home Edition is free. Um, it works great. I've never had a problem with it. Um, it's pretty lightweight. I mean, it finds a lot of like just junk email stuff that's uh, that you have to then go and remove. Um, you know, using their their built-in uh, quarantine manager. Um, but it's it's pretty pretty straightforward process and it it's, works very well. I've never like gotten a virus. I've never, you know, I think I've seen one on a client a couple of times in the last, you know, 10 or 12 years. Um, so it's very rare to actually see like a Mac virus that's affecting things on the Mac, uh, certainly these days. Um, but uh, adware is definitely a problem. And if you just got slow web browsing, the adware medic uh, site that Jerry recommended is, has a really great tool. It's really simple to run and it'll just remove that stuff. So you don't have to suffer with ads, you know, on all these websites and slowing things down. Um, but yeah, antivirus, I would, I would say, uh, you know, it's a good idea. Jerry, Sam, same. Well, same I mean, I, I echo, uh, Joe's sentiments there. If you wanted to pay for something, uh, there's a company called ESET, E S E T, that makes a product for Windows for many years called NOD32 that's been recommended. So they do make a, uh, a paid Mac product. And again, what's appealing about that versus something like Symantec or McAfee is the fact that um, this particular antivirus is very, very lightweight. So it, it doesn't really slow your machine down, it doesn't impede your workflow. A lot of these antiviruses are bloatware um, and they really can have an impact on your productivity. So uh, the product from uh, ESET is pretty reliable and pretty solid. Or I'm gonna jump on, Yeah, I'm going to jump on the Jerry bandwagon there. I mean, I've been using Sophos for quite a while as well, but NOD32, it, it's just raged in popularity lately. And I think it's a very well-rounded product. We, we've used Symantec in some corporate environments where they have a Symantec Endpoint Protection Manager, and that's where we'll install that on the Macs. But I've historically used to Sophos, as Joe mentioned, but NOD32 is, is uh, something I've really liked as of late. Good, some, some good things to think about there if you have some concerns. And a couple of websites you probably should visit, take a look and see. I mean, you might be surprised at what you find on your own machine. Uh, right. I sincerely yeah. hope not, but maybe so. <laughs> So, um, so command control power is the podcast. You all are on every episode, or do you juggle back and forth? Uh, how, how does that work? Almost every episode, I think, with very rare exceptions, you know, where where one of us is uh, is traveling or something like that. But we pretty much week after week, it's all three of us. Uh, we record every Tuesday at eight thirty p.m. Eastern time, and uh, we do a live show. So you know, definitely check us out at commandcontrolpower.com and. Go to the live link on uh, Tuesday nights, and you can uh, follow along as well. Participate in the chat, and so we we encourage that as well. And we're approaching a hundred shows, so you know, hopefully, you know, hundreds and hundreds more. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and it, we never run out of topics. It's pretty yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, what are you, a little bit of inside baseball? What are you using to stream the show? Uh, Mixler. Mixler. Don't know. Mixler. That yeah. M I X L R. I think. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So, so people can listen to you live, then type questions in the chat room and go from there. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Or on iTunes, they can subscribe, and we'd love to have you. Great. Give us a listen. Great. Well, I would say that after this, they definitely would want to listen because it sounds like you guys just have your hands on the pulse of of everything that's going on and all the problems. And uh, so maybe if they have problems, they can go there and you can solve them for them, or sure. at least try to. Mm -hmm. So. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Really a pleasure. I hope you all have a great holiday season. 
Thank Thanks you for having drinks. us, Chuck. This is great, great, Chuck. Folks, Jerry, Sam, and Joe from Command Control Power, go check them out on their website. Go check out their show. Uh, you're bound to get a lot out of it. And I hope to see you right back here on Mac Voices. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.